The following is a Silver Bullion Television audio cast. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Our guest today is Mike Beck of Regent Advisors, LLC. Mike is an investor known for his acumen to spot trends early. One such trend was the opportunity in uranium back in 2005 when it was about $20 per pound. Euramin, a company which Mike invested in, bought depressed uranium mining assets for $4 million, but sold them for $2.5 billion two years later when the uranium price skyrocketed to more than $130 per pound back in 2007. And we are delighted to have him here today as our guest. Good day, Mike, and welcome to SBTV. Patrick, thanks very much and very happy to talk today about electric vehicles and the implications of what I think um, is maybe the single most important development for the metals and mining sector since perhaps the the start of the China super cycle in in the early 2000s, and um, hopefully your your listeners will be persuaded of that after after our our discussion as well. Yes, we are looking forward to having a chat with you. We know that you have done some absolutely incredible things and continue to see some incredible things happening in this electric vehicle metal space. What you did with the uranium trade back in the mid-2000s was absolutely incredible. How do you tell if a trend is worth looking into or how big an impact it is going to be? Uh, specifically, what do you look for? Well, <clears throat> you know, you never really know, and a big part of it is is pure unadulterated luck. We were fortunate in getting the uranium call right. It it actually uh, exceeded our expectations, probably by an order of magnitude. And and we start to always. Um, I have a longtime partner, Stephen Detells, and we start. F- First and foremost, with the macro view, and and electric vehicles is is a good example of that. We've been looking at this thematic for two and a half or three years now, and um, in our view, it's a lot easier if if you get the macro right, because if you have an underlying rising commodity price, um, it makes the the rest of it easy. So, in the case of electric vehicles. Um, there is no question um, that this revolution is is on its way, and I, I think your listeners will have that view after the discussion. It's really just a question now in our mind um, of how fast the adoption of electric vehicles will will take place. And we think it's going to surprise on the upside, and, and maybe it's worthwhile for me to spend a few minutes just talking about this thematic and and the driving forces behind it, which we think are are irreversible. Um, so so the first the first driver is um, government regulation, and this is principally in the form of increasingly stringent emission standards um, around the world, and the only way manufacturers can meet these increasingly stringent emission standards is by increasing the mix of zero emission, i.e. electric vehicles, in their fleet sales. Um, You also have um, specific mandates which are being implemented in in various jurisdictions. So, for example, California last year mandated that by 2025, 25% of every vehicle manufacturer's sales into the California market must be zero emission. And then China similarly has a mandate that starting 2019, 12, which is around the corner, um, 12% of, of passenger vehicle sales need to be electric. So these are, these are pretty compelling um, mandates, uh, whether whether you like them or not, as a vehicle manufacturer, you you have no choice if you want to continue to sell your vehicles into these jurisdictions to comply. But maybe a, a more important driver is economic, because at the end of the day, economics trumps all else. And 
uh, we're fast approaching a time where it will be cheaper for the consumer to purchase and operate an electric vehicle over an internal combustion engine equivalent. And this is being driven by improving battery performance. So on average, since 2012, battery performance has improved uh, year on year at the rate of 15 percent. And there is no sign of that um, trend abating. And if you do some um, rough projections, um, then uh, by 2022, it will actually be cheaper for a consumer in the European Union to purchase and operate an electric vehicle over a diesel equivalent. About 12 months later, 2023, the same will hold true in the EU for petrol vehicles. And shortly thereafter, by 2024, it's projected that um, the same economics will apply in jurisdictions like the U.S. and China, i.e. that it will be cheaper for the consumer to purchase and operate an electric vehicle over its life than the equivalent ICE, internal combustion engine. And at the point you have these 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 crossovers, it's in in our view, it's game over because at that point um, you've reached a tipping point, and why would any rational consumer uh, purchase a more expensive obsolete technology, which is a combustion engine vehicle, when they can get a clean, efficient, and cheaper electric vehicle? And, and you know, we won't. We won't be having interviews like this because um, uh, it will be just taken as obvious that um, electric vehicles like smartphones are here and they're they're not um, going away. Uh, what what will be going away are combustion engines. So that that's perhaps maybe the biggest driver um, of this um, coming revolution. And. There's a third driver, which is also economic, which isn't talked um, about much, but is is important, particularly from the perspective of the auto manufacturers, and and it's economic as well. And it turns out that electric vehicles are are simpler and faster and cheaper to build compared to internal internal combustion engine vehicles. So, to give you some specific um, metrics. Um, the 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 tooling and the factory for an electric vehicle is about half the footprint and half the capital cost of the equivalent um, conventional combustion engine um, facility, and baked in is about a one third um, intrinsic um, reduction in labor costs and and. And all of this is really a reflection of, of simply the fact that electric vehicles have far fewer um, components than internal combustion engines. And in fact, in the powertrain, uh, they have about one third the number of components. And so they're just simpler, easier, faster, cheaper to build. And for an automaker, um, just projecting ahead, um, in five or six years, uh, those automakers that have the highest mix of electric uh, vehicles in their production line will, by extrapolation, have the lowest unit production costs and will have a comparative advantage versus um, the laggards in the industry who are still uh, pumping out largely combustion engine vehicles. So, so these are three pretty compelling drivers. That is um, the regulatory driver in, in terms of emission standards imposed by various governments and jurisdictions. To uh, we're fast approaching a point where it's cheaper for the consumer to to purchase and operate an electric vehicle. And then number three, from the vehicle manufacturer standard standpoint, it's actually a lot less expensive to to build and assemble electric vehicles than their combustion engine um, equivalents. So, so um, no, you you say well, all that's very interesting, but what what does that mean in terms of actual um, adoption of electric vehicles? Well, 
if we if we look um, last year, 2017, electric vehicles were about one percent of the passenger vehicle market. Um, this year is, um, which is nearly done, is on track to uh, be double that figure, two percent. But um, really, the proliferation of electric vehicle offerings is just beginning, uh, with manufacturers tooling up to expand the number of electric vehicles being offered to the public, and and that coupled with the drivers that um, I spoke about uh, just a minute ago. Uh, the consensus estimate is by 2025, uh, something on the order of 15 percent of passenger vehicle sales will be electric. And by 2035, um, it's anticipated by by most analysts that the majority of passenger vehicle sales will be electric. So um, and this is kind of mirrored in some of the um numbers you see um, and targets that, that have been published by various uh, vehicle manufacturers. So, for example, Volkswagen has announced and, in fact, is is tooling now for 30 percent of their passenger vehicle sales by 2025 to be electric vehicle sales. And so that's twice the consensus estimate. And our view is that actually um, – the the transition to electrification of um, the passenger vehicle market is likely to surprise on the upside and that we'll see a classic S curve adoption rate, um, you know, like you saw with smartphones where you had the early adopters, which were maybe 10 percent of the market, and then all of a sudden the the prices dropped, the functionality increased, and over the next 18 months, um, owners of smartphones went from 10% to the majority. And we'll see the same sort of dynamic here. It won't be 18 months because people don't replace their vehicles as rapidly as they place, replace their smartphones, but we're going to see the same sort of S curve, and when it becomes when we hit those crossover points that I talked about earlier, where it's actually cheaper to to purchase and and operate an electric vehicle, it's it's kind of game over, um, and that's the tipping point. And at that point, um, virtually every rational consumer will purchase an electric vehicle, not a combustion engine vehicle. In the not too distant future. Um, when your neighbor comes home and um, announces, uh, if it's at least in the U.S., that they bought a um, combustion engine uh, Chrysler minivan, uh, the neighbor will look at them and say, "Well, why? Why did you do that? Why? Why? Why didn't you buy an electric vehicle? What? What drove you to that?" And and I think that day is is rapidly approaching. So, so that's kind of the 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 driver of this um, electric vehicle revolution, and why we think the 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 thesis is not only compelling, but it's irreversible and it's underway now. Uh, you know, Bill Gates uh, said once many years ago in one of his books that um, the the public tends to overestimate um, what um, technology will bring in the next two years, but grossly underestimates what technology will bring in the next 10 years. And I, I think this is sort of a classic case of that. Oh, and this, as as these EV adoption rates um, tick up, we're going to see um, some major implications for uh, the metals market. And I'd be happy to talk about um, that because ultimately that's our, that's our interest. We're we're first and foremost um, investors in in the mining and the metals industry. Uh, most people are aware of electric vehicles, but I think it's safe to say not many are familiar with the composition of electric vehicle batteries and the need and the value of nickel and cobalt and the role they play. So with our conversation here today, I'm hoping you can guide us through why many, many eyes and ears are on nickel and cobalt. Yeah, no, no, I'd be happy to, uh, Patrick. So just by way of background, the the global nickel market really is um, driven by stainless steel production. And um, 
uh, historically, the nickel market has really been a, um, a stainless steel mm-hmm. story because it's, it's it's used as an alloying agent for uh, corrosion um, and other p- properties. And the nickel, when you speak about the nickel market, you really have to talk about uh, two um, two products that constitute the nickel market. There is um, what what is often referred to as the high purity class one. Uh, nickel and the lower purity class two nickel and <clears throat> stainless steel um, accounts for a, a approximately seventy five percent of current demand and the nickel market is a market just to put in size and perspective is about two point one million tons per annum so um, compared to look that small compared to let's say the the copper market, copper is the biggest base metal, and it's 23 million tons. So the nickel market by volume is about 10% the size of the copper market, but it's it's rather large by comparison with some niche metals like lithium. So, for example, it's 10 times the size of the uh, lithium market, and it's um, 20 times the size of the cobalt market. And if you if you drill down on the 2.1 million tons of mine supply annually, about half of that, 50% is class one, which is the high purity uh, nickel, and 50% is the lower purity, um, so-called class two nickel. And the story of the nickel market the past decade has um, really been about class two nickel, which has greatly increased its share of total mine supply from in 2009, which is not that long ago, was 25% of nickel supply to now half of of global nickel supply. And um, the key driver for for this, um, and this is a rather remarkable uh, change because the mining metals industry is typically um, very slow moving, so to go from 25% of mine supply to 50% as class two has done, mm-hmm. there has to be the driver. And the driver has been increased demand really from Chinese stainless steel producers who were seeking to reduce costs by using less expensive nickel units from something called nickel pig iron, NPI, rather than a traditional class one nickel. So the the the, particularly the lower end range, quality range of stainless steel uh, manufacturer in China um, didn't want to pay the high prices. Nickel hit up high in 2007 at $50,000 a ton. Today it's about $11,000 a ton. Right. And that that created innovation in terms of substitution of, of class two nickel for class one in the form of nickel pig iron. Um, but now here's the interesting um, point um, for um, the nickel market as it relates to electric vehicles. Um, battery um, fabricators, cathode makers in particular, can only use class one nickel for battery production. Oh, okay. And um, and the reason is, is that class two, three, especially iron units, ferrous units, which, which impede the um, the electrochemical characteristics of the battery chemistry. So this is kind of interesting, and this is a nuance, but it's an important one, um, that really when you talk about electric vehicle and the the knock-on demand uh, for nickel, you really have to be specific and talk about knock-on demand for class one nickel Mm. because um, battery um, fabricators and manufacturers cannot use class two. So to give your listeners some some idea of the kind of numbers we're talking about, um, if you look at the dominant battery chemistry, which is called um, NMC, which stands for nickel, manganese, uh, cobalt, mm-hmm. um, and you take sort of a, a standard battery pack in an electric vehicle, which would be 60 kilowatt hour battery pack, um, you need about... 35 kilograms of nickel um, for that unit. And in, in fact, um, a lot of the research at the moment in, in, in battery um, technology and development and chemistry is, 
is is targeted at increasing the nickel units in the battery chemistry because nickel really provides the energy density. So the more nickel you can you can stuff in the in the chemistry, the higher the energy density, which means um, in the the longer the um, the traveling range of the vehicle. Okay. And um, so what it, what does this mean? Let's so that's kind of the the background on nickel market and a little bit on battery chemistry as it relates to nickel. But what does this mean for uh, simple investors like like us? Well, you know, knowing this, you can you can then rather easily with a spreadsheet sort of work out um, what some of the numbers are. So if you if you know you've got 35 kilograms on average and you assume a standard sort of mix of battery chemistries and you you accept the consensus view that 15 percent of passenger vehicles by 2025 will be electric Mm -hmm. in terms of new passenger vehicle sales. The the passenger vehicle market is about 885 million units a year. Then, and you do the math, and you you end up with an incremental demand of about 600,000 tons per Mm -hmm. annum of nickel. But importantly, class one nickel. So th- this is really pretty uh, staggering because um, this represents a huge incremental demand. Yes. Um, as total class one nickel mine supply today is only a million tons. So what you're what you're suggesting is that, and 2025 is not that far away. That um, within the next seven years. The nickel class one mine supply must go from 1 million to 1.6 million tons. Actually, it has to go higher than that because don't forget about the demand just for stainless steel. Right, right. So so you're talking about the nickel market over the next decade really having to double um, total mine supply. And this is a little bit different than a lithium and we'll talk about cobalt in a minute, but uh, th- these are um, these are not niche. Nickel is not a niche metal, um, mm-hmm. and to get an extra um, million tons of Class One nickel supply is a non-trivial non-trivial exercise. Particularly when you look at the long lead time for new supply, and you look at the fact that since the nickel price collapsed after the peak in 2007. There's been very little new nickel capacity introduced because prices have been low, and it takes on average seven years to to bring on a new nickel mine. Um, this suggests that um, the nickel price is going to have to go up dramatically in order to incentivize producers to invest capital. Shortages will emerge because there's a structural supply deficit baked right. into the pipeline because nobody's built any new or, or is building any new nickel capacity of any size um, the last seven or eight years. And it looks like it's going to be a perfect storm. Um, and we could see nickel prices, you know, again, nickel prices at the moment are about $11,000 a ton. I can tell you categorically no no miner in the right mine is going to invest in a new nickel project at eleven thousand dollars a ton the nickel price is going to have to go to twenty to thirty to forty thousand dollars a ton before new investment is attracted and and then even when that occurs it's going to take five to seven years to bring a new mine on and we're talking about not just one mine, but many, many mines to kind right. of deliver an incremental 800 to a million tons of additional supply, basically doubling the capacity of the class one nickel worldwide mine supply. And so this is this is um, sort of our analysis. Yeah, it seems like all this is going to be happening pretty quick with the adoption of electric vehicles. Uh, Mike, where do you see the opportunity for investors with this electric vehicle story? So um, <clears throat> that's that's sort of the million dollar question, and and that's really um, the question we ask ourselves. So, look, um, 
If you if you accept that sort of uh, thematic and investment um, thesis, uh, that is that electric vehicles are uh, going to um, uh, undergo mass adoption at the expense of combustion engines, it it has implications across the entire supply chain. Now, we happen to focus on raw materials, so our interest is more on the metal side. So you then ask yourself, well, what what metals are going to be most impacted? And and the answer is lithium, cobalt, uh, nickel, and copper. And um, maybe it might be worthwhile for me to at, focus at least on a couple of them, perhaps nickel, cobalt. So, so uh, how have we played it. So look, we, we we kind of take a portfolio approach and um we for for our sort of liquid large cap exposure we we've bought Norilsk nickel, which is mm-hmm. the world's second largest um nickel producer and we think is cheap and and clearly because um of uh, the fact that the they're the world's second largest nickel producer, they're going to benefit um uh, greatly as the nickel price Rises, and and um, Vale, by the way, is is the world's largest nickel mm-hmm. uh, producer. You may ask why we didn't buy Vale. Well, the problem is Vale is really an iron ore producer, and nickel mm-hmm. represents about fifteen percent of their EBITDA. So, when you buy Vale, you're not getting nickel; you're getting iron ore. And uh, whereas Norilsk is um, nickel is um, uh, their major cash um, driver in their in their portfolio of metals they produce. So um, for the small cap uh, sort of end of the spectrum, which is where we also like to to play because this is where you have the potential if you get the call right to 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 make it, a, a, you know, 5, 10, 15 X your investment. We've invested in two um, names. Um, both are micro caps, both listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. One is called Giga Metals Corporation, mm-hmm. Giga G I G A is the is the ticker, and and it has a um, a de minimis market cap of seven million Canadian dollars. It has about the same in cash. Uh, so, uh, but what interests us is that they happen to own um, the world's second largest undeveloped nickel sulfide deposit, and happens to be in British Columbia. And um, we see it as a um, sort of a massive undated call option uh, almost for free on the nickel price since it has a market cap of $7 million and it has $7 million of cash. So it has an EV of effectively zero and you're getting the, the exposure to nickel for free. And because of the scale of this deposit, we think as the nickel price and the fact it's in a safe jurisdiction, Canada, we think mm-hmm. uh, as the nickel price starts to ratchet up that um, uh, strategic investors and financial investors will will discover the company and will will significantly build, bid its its price up. And we see this as being a a you know the easily the potential to go from a market cap of seven million to seventy million to a hundred million, and um, just because of the scale of their deposit, if we get the macro call right, and our second sort of uh, small cap is a is a tiny it's even smaller it has a market cap of only three million um, Canadian dollars. It's called Grid Metals, the ticker is G R I D, and. It owns an advanced nickel copper deposit in Manitoba. It's much smaller than Gigas, but it's it's also like Gigas, very advanced. We tend not to like exploration risk, so in our view, neither of these micro cap companies have exploration risk because um, both of them have been drilled out and have um, established um, 43101 uh, resources. So. So that that's kind of the way we've gotten exposure on the large cap and Norilsk at the small cap and Giga Metals and Grid Metals. And that's sort of our view of the nickel market. Okay, got a question for you, Mike. You mentioned class one nickel, you mentioned class two nickel. Uh, each class or nickel type has a distinct use, but currently we see just one nickel price. Should the price for nickel be broken down into a class one nickel price and a class two nickel price to reflect the supply, the demand, 
and the usage because right now we are not seeing the price of nickel reflecting the distinction of class one or battery grade nickel, the nickel sulfides, and class two, which is commonly used in products such as stainless steel. Yes, and, and we think one of the untold um, stories of which will come uh, soon enough is that um, there will be a bifurcation of the nickel market, particularly in pricing, and that you will see on the LME in the not-too-distant future a separate price quoted for Class 1, which mm -hmm. will be a premium to Class 2. And at the moment, that hasn't happened because um, the electric vehicle story has had de minimis impact on the nickel market because, again, electric vehicle penetration rate, even though it's growing rapidly, it was 1% of the passenger vehicle market last year, 2% this year, mm -hmm. could be 4% next year, um, hasn't really uh, bifurcated, hasn't grown sufficiently to bifurcate the market. But we see that coming. And so we think in the not too distant future, you will see separate quotes for class one versus class two. Um, again, because you cannot use class two for battery fabrication. And so the overall, the nickel story is, the nickel market, by the way, has been in deficit the last three years. And the price really hasn't moved because excess inventory that, that built up because of oversupply in previous years has just been worked off. It's anticipated, and, and this is an, uh, an entirely separate the topic. It could be a, an entirely separate discussion, but we think that the, 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 in, the surplus inventories will be worked off completely in the next 18 months, and then we'll start to see, um, a, actually prior to that, a, a real structural uptick in the nickel price. So nickel is kind of... It's not today's story. It's going to be a story two years from now. But, you know, our view is that if you, if you, if you think um, and you have conviction in your thesis, it pays to be early. Mm -hmm. And even though, and our capital, since it's our own money, is patient capital, we don't mind. And that's why we put this. We've started putting nickel exposure on as of 18 months ago, and we're happy always to be too early and and to have uh, the share certificate sitting in the desk drawer and so that we're completely uh, well positioned when the price starts to move because when the price starts to move it starts to move quickly and then you have to pay a, a lot more to um, to get yourself positioned you rarely hear anything about nickel but cobalt it was moving astronomically last year it was. Look, the cobalt price went from $10 a pound to in excess of $40 a pound, and it's pulled back in the last four months or so. Now it's about it, – it sort of – it got a little bit ahead of the story, and um, it's pulled back to $34 a pound. Um, um, so cobalt is really uh, interesting, and um, it is – it's a niche metal. Um Mm -hmm. And um, it is uh, by far the most supply-constrained um, metal in the – not just the battery metal metal spectrum, but the entire spectrum of all metals. And I'll, I'll give a bit of background. It may be of interest to your, to your listeners because it's a really interesting story. So just to put things in perspective, the total worldwide mine supply for cobalt is about 100,000 tons uh, per annum. That's a pretty small um, uh, metal by um, industry standards. Uh, yes. Just to put that in 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 comparison, that's about um, half of one percent. And I'll repeat that: half of one percent of the size of the copper market. A copper market is about twenty-three million mm -hmm. tons a year. So this is a hundred thousand tons, and it's about five percent in terms of volume. Um, of the nickel market, which, as we just discussed, is about a two million ton per annum market. Um, and but cobalt is really <clears throat> interesting for the following reasons: one, fifty percent of current use, uh, not future use, but current use today is for batteries. So that's kind of interesting um, because um, you know the the battery 
thematic is is as we've talked about at the start of this interview is um is not here today it's but it's coming rapidly so that just uh, boggles the mind and I'll talk about some demand impact uh figures for cobalt from uh, electric vehicles in a in a moment but it also is a uh, particularly interesting and cobalt um, from a supply standpoint because two-thirds of cobalt supply um, originates from the Congo, which is maybe um, not the world's most stable jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So um, things can go bump in the middle of the night in the Congo. There can be a civil war. There can be government imposition of... um, of windfall of royalties, there can be you you pick it. There can be an, any number of things. Uh, there could be a boycott of all production from the Congo because of concerns about child child labor. So a lot of stuff could happen that could disrupt um, supply from the Congo, and that would be um, um, a disaster for the supply chain since yeah. Congo supplies two thirds of the world's cobalt. But it would be really interesting from an investor's perspective, um, somebody that is long cobalt, because it means that prices would skyrocket even further. The the other interesting aspect to cobalt um, is that with one rather modest exception, there is no such thing as a cobalt mine. Right. A cobalt mine does not exist. Uh, there happens to be one small exception in Morocco, but um, – Cobalt only occurs as a minor byproduct to certain copper and certain nickel production. So if you want uh, more cobalt, you can't just open a new cobalt mine because there's no such thing as a cobalt mine. You have to produce more copper or more nickel and you're not going to produce more copper or more nickel if you're a producer because cobalt typically represents less than 5% of your revenues. You're only going to produce if the copper price goes up or the nickel price goes up. So there's, in other words, there's no easy way to stimulate new production mm-hmm. um, directly. Uh, unless copper and nickel prices rise to incentivize new production because a typical, let's say, nickel mine that has a um, small cobalt byproduct credit um, where nickel is 97% of the value um, is not going to invest more capital to produce more cobalt unless they're investing more capital to produce more nickel because the cobalt is just a minor byproduct. Um, so this is um, this is interesting. The fact that two thirds of the mine supply, world mine supply, comes from an unstable country, the Congo, and the fact that um, cobalt is produced as a minor byproduct to certain um, copper and certain nickel. There, there also another interesting aspect, which actually, um, going back to uranium, uh, shares. Um, the same sort of characteristic as uranium did. Um, the cobalt mm-hmm. price is highly inelastic. It represents only one to two percent of the sticker price of an electric vehicle. So, if there's a supply disruption um, because of politics or other reasons in the Congo, or supply shortages just emerge because the EV demand for cobalt is outstripping uh, the capacity of the industry to deliver, battery um, manufacturers will pay 10x today's price, and and it, you you don't have to worry about demand destruction. Yeah. Because if, if the, you know, the current cobalt price is $34, if, if the manufacturer has to pay $150 a a pound uh, for cobalt, 5x today's price, uh, you'll do it because it it may raise the sticker price of the electric vehicle from, you know, by two or three percent. Not enough to um, to uh, cause demand destruction. 
So, so this is kind of a perfect storm as we see it um, emerging for uh, cobalt because of these rather unique characteristics. And if I give you some specific numbers, um, if you um, if you if you assume that electric vehicles are 15% of the passenger vehicle market by 2025, which is kind of the consensus view, and as we said earlier, is likely to be understated. What does that mean? It means the world is going to have to produce three and a half times mm -hmm. today's cobalt. So the world, um, over the next seven years, is going to have to increase cobalt production by 350%. And this is for a metal that um, is only produced as a byproduct, and two thirds of which comes from the Congo. You can see, um, you can imagine many scenarios where um, that doesn't happen, and the consequence is the price, because of the price in elasticity, goes really crazy. Um, and if you look, just look at one one uh, model. So look at the Tesla Model Three, just to pick one. So. Tesla is planning to produce a half a million of those um, units a year. Um, a, a Model 3 um, with the high-end battery pack and using Tesla's NCA battery chemistry, which is low on cobalt, will will need about 8 kilograms, let's say, per unit. Let's say, let's call it 10, just to keep the math simple, 500,000 vehicles per annum. Mm -hmm. And you do the arithmetic means uh, that just that one vehicle will generate demand for 5,000 tons of cobalt. That's 5% of world mine supply. And that's just one vehicle from wow. a small um, manufacturer. Um, you can imagine what happens when Volkswagen um, starts, you know, achieves its goal yes. of 30% of its sales by 2025 in the form of electric vehicles. So we think cobalt's really interesting, really interesting, and it's one of these once-in-a-lifetime sort of metal events for investors in the sector. And for us, there was only one real way to play it. The, the biggest producer of cobalt in the world, about 20, 30% of the world's cobalt is it comes from Glencore, but you can't really play it um, by buying Glencore because in, in the overall mix of Glencore's revenues, uh, cobalt might represent 10%. So um, the only pure play, um, that, that at least from our perspective, is a company called Cobalt 27, uh, 27 is the – it's listed on the TSX, uh, Toronto mm -hmm. Stock Exchange. It's a pure cobalt play. It really owns only two things. It was listed um, last year. It's raised $800 million. Um, it, so it has relatively um, good liquidity. It trades sort of $1 to $3 million a day. And you um, – you, you, when you buy cobalt 27, you get two things. Cobalt 27 has the – largest uh, physical stockpile of cobalt metal sitting in a warehouse, second only to the Chinese government's strategic uh, reserve. And then it also um, earlier this year did two mm. streaming deals, one with Vale, one with Highland Pacific, whereby it's bought their a portion of their cobalt production for the next 30 years. So it's a it's an absolute, which is the way it was constructed pure cobalt play. If the cobalt price is up, cobalt 27 share price is up. If the cobalt price is down, it's down. And for investors that want an unadulterated exposure mm -hmm. to to cobalt and its possible moves in the future, um, I would um, strongly uh, recommend do, doing what we've done, which is to, to buy cobalt Cobalt 27, stick it in your portfolio, and um, and stay tuned for the uh, the fireworks. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. I think nickel and cobalt are slowly slowly starting to creep out, and people are really taking notice of the electric vehicle story. Do you have a website where our listeners can find more about your work and Cobalt 27? The short answer is no. Look, I'm I'm a, a private family office, and so we we invest really just for our own account. So we don't have a website. We don't, um, 
you know, we're not uh, portfolio managers. We don't run third-party money. So the the short answer is is no. Uh, we we invest simply for our own um, account, and um, and from time to time we'll have conversations with folks um, like you that um, are interested in sort of our our thinking, and we find it stimulating to to speak with like-minded investors. But uh, I'm sorry, uh, we don't have a website. We don't, um, yeah. Well, sometimes not having a website is, is, is a bit better. Uh, <laughs> well, it keeps it keeps life simple. Yeah, we'll um, absolutely uh, try and get you back on the show. But, Mike, I, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on the show, and it, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Patrick, thank you very much, and uh, look forward to chatting again. Take care. You too. Take care, Mike. That was Mike Beck of Region Advisors, LLC, sharing with us his invaluable insights and the opportunities in the electric vehicle and battery metal space. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.